Okay, so this is the um, last set of lectures in uh, Module 5. Let's look at the wrist and hand. Uh, we're not going to go into so much detail with the wrist and hand um, just because there's a lot of complexity there and somewhat out of the scope of uh, the functional anatomy aspect. We all look at like basic hand movement, uh, particularly combined with the wrist, and uh, we'll be piggybacking off of what we learned from the elbow, looking at pronation and uh, supination. So here's your here's your hand, and you can see similar to the foot that um, instead of a bunch of tarsals, we had some carpals here, um, and then you have your metacarpals, and then you have your phalanges, and this makes up your one, two, three, four, five fingers, your wrist. Here's your radius. Here's your ulna, and uh, the hand is is amazing. I personally don't think it's as cool as the foot. Um, remember, the hand is not load bearing. Most of our uh, fine motor skills, uh, we have exceptional um, hand-eye coordination, and um, a lot of our brain development is due to this fine motor control that we have. But there's a very strong relationship that exists between the hand and the eyes and our expression uh, and some of the skill that we, we can do. So uh, hand function is really important. Um, there's a whole discipline of therapy within occupational therapy that are just hand specialists looking at recovery, overuse injuries, uh, and so forth. So when we look at our hand, um, you can kind of see here superimposed. Let me go one image forward and I'll come back. Um, you can see the carpals are here down by your wrist. Here's your thumb. And then uh, right where if you were to wear a ring, that would start right about where that metacarpal and first uh, phalangeal joints at. So your phalanges have three bones. They have a distal section, a middle section, and a proximal section. And that's consistent for all four fingers. And then when you look at your thumb, there's no middle section. There's a distal and a proximal. You have five metacarpals. And you should have seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I'm sorry, eight uh, carpal bones. So that's what we're looking at for wrist function. Um, all of these are joints. So that's a joint. That's a joint. That's a joint. This is a joint. All of these are joints. And then you have your wrist joint there. So I'll go back one slide. Um, you have your fingers. Uh, you have your middle finger your ring finger, your pointer index finger, your small or pinky finger, and then your thumb or your hallux. Um, this is the uh, thener eminence and then the hypothemer. And then uh, you have your dif different uh, creases in your hand. And not that you're going to do any palm reading or anything, but these, these lines are actual anatomical uh, lines. And these are products of the skin bending based on the type of movements that are occurring at each of these joints. Um, the hand is numbered, the fingers, so digit number one is your thumb, digit number five is your pinky or little finger, and then in between, so one, two, three, four, five. And so that's how the bones are named as well, and the, and the joints. So the interphalange uh, joint of um, digit number three. You can kind of see the posterior and anterior aspect of the hand here. You can see the radius, the ulna, radius and the ulna, depending upon pronated or supinated position, and again, your phalanges, your fingers your metacarpals, and then your carpal bones. This is what um, one of your fingers looks like. And so you have the three joints, one, two, three. And then you have the relationship here of the, um, the metacarpal right here, and then interacting with the carpal bones. So here's a roadmap of your joints. You have the radial carpal joint, which is where we're going to focus most of our tension on. Just like you had a mid-tarsal joint within the foot, you have a mid-carpal joint within the wrist, and then you have a <coughs> carpal, metacarpal joint um, between the metacarpals and the carpals. Within the fingers themselves, you have three divisions. You have your distal phalanges, your middle, and your proximal. So you have your distal interphalange joint, proximal interphalange joint, and metacarpal phalange joints. And then remember that you don't have a pip joint uh, at the thumb. If you look at the uh, posterior view or inferior view of your hand, you'll see that here are the two main bones that articulate with the to make the wrist. So these there's only two of the carpals, the scaphoid and the lunate. A little bit with the tricretrum, but the lunate and the scaphoid are the two primary. And that articulates directly onto the radius. That's why it's called the radial carpal. You can see here there's very little uh, congruency here with the ulna. Most of that is by the uh, radius. And so when you look at the amount of radial and ulnar deviation, so hand movements here we'll talk about in the next lecture, um, the structure of the joint really allows for a lot of radial deviation. So you bring in your pinky to your elbow, 
and not as much radial deviation you trying to bring your thumb to your elbow. This image uh, was from a previous lecture when we looked at the elbow and the forearm and you can see the radius there. Uh, nice deep groove to articulate with the scaphoid and lunate. Um, here's your proximal end of your uh, forearm and here's your distal end. And you can see that styloid, that bone pick sticking out there. Um, that articulates with the scaphoid, scaphoid and lunate. And you can kind of see that the most of the attachment here is between the radial carpal between those two bones. You can see here that big space here, there's an articular disc, and that most of the bony congruency is between the scaphoid and the lunate. Here's your thumb, here's your pinky finger, radius ulna, that disc that's there, and the first row of carpal bones that make the radial carpal joint. There's some connective tissue here. Um, there's actually a lot of connective tissue, but you ha again, you have a radial collateral ligament, an ulnar collateral ligament to check um, frontal plane movement. You have your um, anterior and posterior carpal ligaments here. Um, quite a bit that we're not going to talk about, but the one that's, that's pretty popular is this transverse carpal ligament. So this transverse carpal ligament um, creates the carpal tunnel. And um, at the base of that are the carpal bones. And you can see the pisiform uh, comes up here. And then there's a hook over here um, uh, on the hamate. And then you have a tubercle on the trapezium. And you have uh, another tubercle on the scaphoid. And that forms the roof or the tent. And then in between here is where all of your um, extrinsic uh, t flexor tendons come through. So if you look at the next slide here, here's that transverse carpal ligament. So it's th this tissue right here is reflected right here. You have your median nerve coming through here, and then you have all of the flexor tendons that are going to the phalanges. So what can happen is um, the, the thought process is, is that the tendons swell, there's irritation, there's some kind of inflammation, and it puts pressure on the nerve. And then that nerve gets irritated, and what um, an orthopedic surgeon will do is he'll do a carpal tunnel procedure where they come in and they cut this tissue to release it and then let it heal back in to basically give that space. Um, it's not uncommon to have it bilaterally in both arms, but um, usually when you see bilateral presentations in um, mechanical or an infl inflammatory type aspect, typically you would look at the, s the spine, the central aspect first, to uh, address where that's at. But it could be a neck issue that's causing problems on the chain, a shoulder issue or an elbow issue or a wrist issue. It's typically found in people that do a lot of office work in different wrist and hand positions that are either in a flexed or extended position or some kind of ulnar radial deviation where they're forcing the fingers to move um, while the uh, wrist is getting irritated from overuse injuries and then putting pressure on that nerve. You can kind of see it in its entirety here. Here's the hand, there's the floor of that, and there's that carpal tunnel there with the median nerve, and then a, a, a cross section of that. If you recall from the foot, um, there were arches, uh, three arches in the foot, and the hand has a similar aspect. Um, there's a distal transverse arch, a longitudinal arch, and a proximal transverse arch. So very similar structure, um, but again, the hand is non-load bearing. So it doesn't. Uh, it, so it has a lot more mobility, and our thumb is in a different position there. So that's the structure of the uh, wrist.